Big Muddy Monster? Sounds like something Roald Dahl would write, but this ain't no children's story. Hey, I'm Neoma Finn. Late in the evening on June 25th, 1973, a young couple decided to spend the last hours of their date sitting in their car on the banks of the Big Muddy River. Randy and Judy most likely weren't putting too much effort into watching the waning moon, nor were they probably all that interested in the stars or the water rippling against the shore. I'm sure they were focused entirely on each other. Suddenly, Randy broke off in mid-sentence and said, What is that smell? Mortified, Judy said indignantly, Well, it isn't me. Before Randy, who realized he'd just made a huge faux pas, could say another word, she got a whiff. Oh, Lord, she moaned, covering her nose. That's awful. The two immediately turned their attention to the outside of their vehicle, certain they were about to see a skunk looking back in with a malicious grin on its face. What they saw wasn't a skunk. It was much larger and much, much more terrifying. Standing outside their car, staring back in at them with red glowing eyes, was a seven-foot-tall creature covered in white hair and mud. It looked like a cousin of Bigfoot, Randy would later explain. But it was what? Randy started the car, threw it into gear, and wasted no time getting them out of there. They rushed straight to the Murfreesboro Police Department and made a report. This might not have gone any further than a report on a piece of paper tossed into the back of a filing cabinet, if not for another Randy and a girl named Cheryl. Several hours later, they rushed into the police station to report seeing the same creature on Cheryl's family farm. He walked out of a patch of trees and just stood there at the edge of the yard, this Randy said. Then it turned around and walked right back into the field, Cheryl added. Randy said he had walked toward the creature and got to within 30 feet of it before it walked away. He described it as being seven to eight feet tall, a pale, dirty white or cream colored and he estimated that it had to weigh 300 to 350 pounds. And it had a murky smell, he said. Sometime later, three young boys were playing wiffle ball in a field. One of the boys smashed a particularly hard foul ball into the nearby woods, and the three ventured in to find it. As they were searching in the weeds at the edge of the trees, one of the boys suddenly screamed out to the others, Look! The other two boys turned to see what their friend was yelling about and saw a huge, hairy creature standing inside the tree line. They said it was covered in hair that they thought was gray and it stood on two legs. The boys stood there staring at the monster for a few minutes before running home to tell their parents. During this same period, a traveling carnival was in town. One night, the police were called out to investigate an incident reported by the carnies. The carnival had a pony ride attraction. At night, those ponies were kept pinned up in a small corral. When one of the carnies went out to check on them, he was shocked to see a massive hairy creature watching the animals. He went and got a couple of his co-workers who also saw the beast. None of the men felt that it was a danger to the ponies. It seemed only interested in looking at them. Nonetheless, they contacted the police and made a report. After the two young couples made their reports, Murfreesboro Police Chief Toby Berger knew he had to do something. Determined to hunt down and destroy the creature that had come to be known as the Thing, he gathered up a posse of men and a team of search dogs. They tracked the footprints from the edge of the yard where the second Randy and Cheryl had seen it standing. The dogs took up the scent right away. The posse followed close behind as the dogs put their noses down and led them across a field, over a stream, through another set of woods, and across another field until they came to a barn. But the second the dogs got to the barn, they stopped. No amount of encouragement could get those dogs to go inside the barn or beyond it. Frustrated, the men put the dogs aside and went in to investigate, 
certain that they had the creature cornered and it would be only a matter of time before it was caught and killed. But a thorough search of the building yielded nothing. No creature, no musky odor, no prints, no indication whatsoever that the creature had ever been there. Still, the dogs refused to go any further. This wasn't the first time Murfreesboro, Illinois, had reports of a strange creature. In 1942, something was reported in the area that struck so much fear of the local citizens that a newspaper article warned parents not to allow their children to go outside alone. By 1988, these sightings came to a halt. Did this creature, or family of creatures, die out? Or did they simply move on? As far back as the earliest European settlers, people in that area have reported seeing big hairy monsters. Illinois might seem like a strange place to find anything Bigfoot-related, but in 2017, reports from that state were second-highest in the nation. And most of those reports came from southern Illinois. Someone once said that Chicago without Illinois is still Chicago, but Illinois without Chicago is Iowa. There's a lot of truth in that statement. Being an Illinois native, I can attest to the general resentment most of us in other parts of the state feel toward Chicago and its surrounding suburbs. It's irritating to tell someone you're from Illinois and have them immediately respond with, Chicago? Even so, it is the one big city in a fairly large state, and without it, the rest of us are just farmland and small towns. Removing Chicago from the equation changes the entire character of that state. For most people in Illinois, Chicago is little more than a thorn on our sides. Not that the rest of the state is so much better. After all, most of us joke that our state motto is, Illinois, where our governors make our license plates. That stems from the fact that four of our last ten governors have gone to prison, while two others were tried and acquitted. I grew up straight west of Chicago on the banks of the Mississippi. As much as I complain about the second city, I have to admit, I've always enjoyed visiting it. Spending a day shopping, visiting the museums or zoos, or taking in a play were always a nice respite from the mundane life of western Illinois. And of course, there's Giordano's Pizza. Although I much prefer Quad City-style pizza to any other, I'll admit, every now and then, I crave a nice Giordano's Chicago-style stuffed pizza. Yes, yes, I am well aware of Gino's and the others, but they're not Giordano's. Because of the many trips I've made there, and because I once had a job where I had to go to Chicago once a month for business meetings, I naturally assumed everyone from my home region had been to Chicago at least once. Imagine my surprise when I slowly discovered how many Quad citizens had never been there. It should then come as no surprise to learn that those who live in southern Illinois, which is much farther away, feel as far removed from Chicago as Pluto is from the sun. It's a different world. Illinois is considered a northern state, but people from the southern part speak with a distinctive southern accent. During the Civil War, there was even an underground rebellion around the Shawnee Forest area that supported the Confederacy. Towns are smaller there. Houses are placed farther apart, and woods, hills, hollers, and prairie fill the gaps. Roads are often canopied by moss-covered trees. A primordial essence fills the air and opens the mind to the possibilities of more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, as Shakespeare so eloquently stated in Hamlet. Legends of monsters and unknown creatures roaming those empty spaces are rampant in that part of Illinois, so far removed from the bustling downtown of Chicago. Even Father Jacques Marquette had to admit when he stumbled across a set of rock paintings near present-day Alton, Illinois, during his exploration of the area with Louis Joliet, that strange creatures lurked in the hidden valleys of this land. He wrote, while skirting some rocks, which by their height and length inspired awe, we saw upon one of them two painted monsters which at first made us afraid, and upon which the boldest savages dare not long rest their eyes. They are as large as a calf. They have horns on their heads like those of a deer, a horrible look, red eyes, a beard like a tiger's, 
a face somewhat like a man's, a body covered with scales, and so long a tail that it winds all around the body, passing above the head and going back between the legs, ending in a fish's tail. Green, red, and black are the three colors composing the picture. Some say those paintings depict an underwater panther, much like what I described in my Arkansas Full of Monsters video. Still others say they're birds. I look at the painting and think dragon, but that's just me. Regardless of what they were meant to depict, one thing is clear. Someone, at one point or another, either had an impressive imagination, a great deal of artistic skill, and a daredevil's heart, where they saw something so terrifying that they felt the need to scale a steep rock wall to paint the creature as a warning to others. If nothing else, it proves that Illinois is full of mystery. The Big Muddy River twists and winds its way for 156 miles across the southern Illinois landscape before dumping into the Mississippi River. While it appears to cradle Murfreesboro in its arms and the way it wraps around it, Farther north, the Big Muddy River looks as though it's trying to avoid Mount Vernon. In 1941, a preacher was out squirrel hunting in the bottomlands around Gum Creek near that town, and he had his own strange encounter. It was a typical clear autumn day. The once lush green world had cooled into a golden tan. Trees, once full of leaves, were shedding them now with every burst of wind. The preacher was walking through this brown and gold world, each step an echoing crunch of ground litter, in search of the elusive squirrel. When cooked right, they make a delicious meal. When cooked wrong, they're a test of jaw strength and chewing endurance mixed with a healthy dose of gaminess. Squirrels barked all around the preacher, warning each other of the intruder. He wasn't concerned. Squirrels are, as you might imagine, a bit squirrely. They'll freeze in place, possibly thinking if they don't move, we won't see them. Then at the last minute, they'll run off in a burst of speed, only to stop again on the trunk of another tree, when they think they are again well hidden. Besides, the preacher figured even if he didn't get any squirrels, it was a beautiful day. And there's nothing quite like a walk in the woods on a day like that to bring a man closer to God. Little did he know he was about to have his own come-to-Jesus moment. Wandering through the woods, lost in his own thoughts, the sudden absence of sound might have escaped the preacher's notice. But when something dropped from a tree directly in front of him, it got his attention. The preacher later said it looked like a baboon. It didn't show the least amount of fear of him. In fact, it came at him. There was no time to take aim, so he struck at it with his gun barrel. Somewhere in the back of his mind, it registered that this thing was walking on two legs. It lurched forward, undeterred, and the preacher swung again, hitting it squarely on the side of the head, but seemingly doing little more than anger it. The preacher backed up a few steps, and it moved forward. The preacher backed up again, this time putting just enough space between them that he was able to point the gun straight into the air and fire a couple of rounds. The sound of the gun blast brought the creature to a full stop. Did it recognize that sound? Who knows? At that point, it turned and ran away. Admittedly, the baboon description put me on edge. The first cryptid that came to mind for me was the dreaded Gugway. It's considered the most dangerous of all Bigfoot types. No one ever accused a Gugway of having a sympathetic nature or intelligence beyond the savage beast. Its only goal appears to be to kill in the most vicious, painful, and bloodthirsty way possible. But would a Gugway be chased off by a few rounds fired into the air? It's an interesting thought. The preacher was not the last to see or hear from the new inhabitant of their woods. All around the Gum Creek Bottoms, farmers and hunters were beginning to tell tales of something large and hairy that looked very much like a baboon standing and watching them from the edge of the woods, raiding their chicken houses at night, and even killing one farmer's dog. School children reported hearing its loud, piercing howl when they rode their bikes or walked the lonely country roads after school or on weekends to visit friends. By the next spring, people were so shook up and terrified that a massive hunt was organized to find the animal and rid the woods of it once and for all. They were unsuccessful, but other hunting parties were formed as the beast began to make appearances in other places as far south as Murfreesboro as far west as Alton, 
and as far north as Peoria. Again and again, men took their weapons and went into the woods searching for it. They found signs of it. Tracks, half-eaten animals, broken trees, and what might have been nests were found everywhere. But they never managed to catch the beast. Meanwhile, reports of it crossing the road in front of cars, jumping creek beds, screaming in the woods, and harming livestock and family pets began to pour out of the region. Then, just as quickly as it began, it all stopped. Judging by the report count in 2017, I can't help but wonder, has it all started again? I'm Neil Finn. Thank you.